Hey guys, welcome back to my channel and remember what we learned in the previous video. We talked about the forces that act on the aircraft. We learned about weight, thrust, lift and drag. But how do you actually define the numerical values of those forces? It's easy to find weight because weight is just mass multiplied by gravitational acceleration so mass of the aircraft m multiplied by g which is 9.81 meters per second squared we will learn how to deal with thrust in one of the future videos so in this video we will focus on lift and drag forces we will learn a formula that lets you calculate the numerical value of those forces okay so let's say this is our aircraft and let's just recap from last video what we learned about the four forces that act on the aircraft. And this aircraft looks weird, but it's okay. I hope you get the idea. So the easiest force to find would be weight. As I already told you, it's equal to mass multiplied by gravitational acceleration. The next force is thrust. And we will talk about it in more detail in one of the future videos. And there's two more aerodynamic forces, which are lift and drag. And today we will learn how to find their values. So it was experimentally determined that lift and drag depend on dynamic pressure. And let me write it down. And I will denote dependence by this little symbol, which means proportional. So lift and drag are proportional to dynamic pressure the area of the wing, and then the specific coefficients, coefficients which are specific for each airfoil. These coefficients depend on the type of the airfoil. So let's write down the actual formulas and talk about those coefficients in more detail. So in order to find lift, we multiply dynamic pressure by the area of the wing and by the lift coefficient, which is denoted by C, subscript capital L. And same is true for drag, but the difference here is the drag coefficient. But now let's write down dynamic pressure in more detail, because we know from previous video that it's equal to one half density times velocity squared. Let's expand this term a little bit. One half density velocity squared, the area of the wing, and there's nothing we can do about the coefficient. And let's do the same thing for drag. Just keep in mind that it's a drag coefficient. So now we can use these formulas to find lift and drag forces and their values, if we know all of these parameters. So where do we find lift and drag coefficients? Well, usually you would need to search the internet to find the lift coefficient of a specific airfoil, which are given by a set of numbers and letters, which we'll talk about in a future video. But generally, lift and drag coefficients are measured in the wind tunnel during the testing of the airfoil design. And it should be given in the wind tunnel testing report. But also you can find these coefficients from the graph of lift coefficient versus angle of attack, which we'll talk about a bit later in this video. So this is basically what you need to remember about how to find lift and drag forces. But lift and drag coefficients are the most important from these two formulas because they are as important as Mach and Reynolds numbers. And why are these coefficients so important? Well, let's compare two aircraft different in size. It's obvious that the larger aircraft will have the larger wing area, which will give you more lift. And also, the larger aircraft can reach higher speeds. So the smaller aircraft cannot generate as much lift as the larger one. But does that mean that the smaller aircraft is worse than the larger one? Not necessarily. 
Here is when the lift coefficient plays a big role. So let's say for the bigger aircraft, the lift coefficient is 0.8, and for the smaller one, it's 1.1. Now, which aircraft is better? Here, the question should be more, which airfoil design is better? Obviously, the higher the lift coefficient, the more efficient the lift production is for the aircraft. So now we can compare the values for the lift coefficients and say that the second aircraft is more efficient even if it's smaller in size. So lift and drag coefficients depend on Mach and Reynolds numbers and also the angle of attack of the aircraft. And remember we learned what an angle of attack is from one of the very first videos. It's the angle alpha between the free stream velocity vector and the cord of the airfoil. For all existing aircraft, the lift and drag coefficients have been calculated, but if you design a new airfoil, then you would have to do testing in the wind tunnel to determine these coefficients, as I already talked about before. A good rule of thumb is that the drag coefficient should be about 10 times smaller than the lift coefficient, which makes sense. We don't want to create a lot of drag if we create a lot of lift. Now let's look at how the lift coefficient changes if we change the angle of attack for a given airfoil. I will draw an approximate graph, but I will also insert a picture here of an actual graph. So most of those graphs look like this graph here, where on the x-axis we have the angle of attack, and on the y-axis we have the lift coefficient, or CL. Why do we have alpha here? Well, it's because the lift coefficient depends on the angle of attack, as you can see from this graph. Now, what does this dependence tell us? Let's analyze this graph. First, we start from zero. But for some airfoils, this graph is shifted a little bit here or here. But for now, it's not that important for us. So let's say we have this airfoil for which at zero angle of attack, we have the lift coefficient equal to zero as well. And if you're not new to aerodynamics, you should be able to tell me which airfoil gives you zero lift at zero angle of attack. I will leave it as a question below. And if you can answer that, please answer in the comments. So for any airfoil, at first we have the lift coefficient grow with the angle of attack. So let's say my marker is the airfoil. So then this position would be angle of attack equal to zero degrees. So with growing angle of attack in the x-axis, it means that the airfoil is moving upwards like this. And the graph tells us that when the airfoil increases the angle of attack, we have more or higher lift coefficient or more lift, as you can see from here. So let's say we increased angle of attack to 20 degrees and we got some value of 0.7 for the lift coefficient. And from here we can calculate the lift force, if you remember the formula from the first part of the video. Now the angle of attack keeps growing and the lift coefficient keeps growing. So it's better for the aircraft to be flying at some angle of attack instead of zero. But eventually we'll get to some point at which we'll reach the maximum possible lift coefficient. Now, what is this point? Well, let's go down here. And let's say this is a critical angle of attack or alpha critical which will give us the maximum value of lift. Now, why is it called critical? Well, because if we increase the angle of attack even more, then we will start losing lift. And this is a point of no return, which is called stall. 
So if we get into this zone, we will completely lose control of the aircraft and we cannot get lift anymore. So this is a very dangerous zone into which the aircraft should never get. So as you can see from the graph, it's better to be flying in this region. Sometimes we want maximum lift, but we should not increase angle of attack more than the critical angle of attack. So how can we explain this phenomenon? Well, here we should remember what we learned about viscosity and turbulence. Remember that at high angles of attack and high velocity, the air will not flow perfectly streamlined around the airfoil. It will start to separate at some point. So the airfoil is now generating lift only in this region. This part is now not generating lift. So if we increase the angle of attack even more like this, sometimes we lose all lift. So here we'll have turbulent region and no lift will be generated at this angle of attack. So how do we prevent the aircraft from going into this stall region? The answer is the safety factor. Usually the software on board has restrictions on which angle of attack can the pilot reach, especially on commercial aircraft. For example, the maximum could be set to 35 degrees angle of attack. And even if the pilot wants to reach a higher angle of attack, he will not be able to because the aircraft will not go into that angle of attack because of the software restriction or limit. So I hope this topic was more or less clear to you because it was pretty simple and introductory. In the future videos, we will go into more detail about the lift coefficients, the lift forces and so on. So this is it for today. Thank you so much for watching and leave your questions and comments below. My next video will be a little bit different than what we used to because it will be more of an informational video since I get a lot of questions about which textbooks do aerospace engineers use. So I will share with you the textbooks that I learned with when I was a student. So stay tuned for that and see you in the next video.